Nathaniel Drew got a tattoo and talks about leaving mental clarity behind him. Tom is telling us to look at the world through other people's eyes. Lewis talks about the beast inside him. Stephen is telling us all to act like idiots. The Olympics starts this week with some incredible athlete stories. An amazing article from Brett is talking about active reading and what we as authors and creators can do to make that easier. Deliberate practice was explored on the Sports Psych Show and daily bore out values were shown and discussed by Tina. Look at the world through everyone else's eyes. Look at it through different perspectives. That is what Tom is talking about in order to get a synthesis behind our reasoning and justification of what it is that we're actually doing. Stephen brought up skateboarders when looking to be creative and looking at the world through a different lens. And this reminds me of when I used to actually coach some of the skateboarders and they looked at an obstacle, they looked at something in the real world and their first thought was, how do I skate that? Not should I skate that? How do I skate that? So maybe when we have an issue, we have a problem, or we have something that we need a solution to, instead of asking ourselves, should we find a solution to this? Ask ourselves, how should we solve this? It certainly brings a new perspective to how we can solve problems. Now, Lewis spoke about the beast inside. We all have a beast inside, whether that's in the physical domain, emotional, cognitive areas, and it, it does get let loose sometimes. But how Lewis deals with that is he trains it. He trains in the physical environment, so he does exercise to curb the beast when it does get let loose. Now, because I think we all have a beast in all of the different environments, what I choose to do is train each beast appropriately. So cognitively challenge myself, physically challenge myself, and emotionally challenge myself, and train myself so when the beast is let loose, I have a little bit more control. But you need to be an idiot. Close the gap. Ask the next questions. That is what Stephen is talking about when you're looking to learn. We should find good thinkers in different directions. Note down our own biases so we can check them. Go to the primary source of information. Maybe phone a friend or check the foundations of the information before we adopt it into our personal philosophy of practice. That is what Steve and Brad are talking about on the Growth Equation blog. I don't think that means you don't put it in your note collection. What it means, though, is you don't put it into your practice unless you have done some sort of critique. Now, as a skeptic, I think I do that pretty well. But not all scientists that share information are totally transparent about what it is that they are talking about. They certainly leave things out to build up a narrative or a context in what they're sharing. So it's not about what they say, but also about how they say it. And Anne was talking about this and kind of adding to another post that she put up about productivity porn, suggesting that creators and individuals that are consuming and creating information that doesn't really add much value, doesn't really add any synthesis, add any critique, or have any references in there, is just feeding a cycle, feeding a loop of consumption that isn't really making anyone productive. Seth spoke about instead of taking initiative, giving initiative. So deciding to do something without someone telling you or learning to do something or learning a skill without a prompt from someone else or just creating a ruckus in the community you are in without any sort of external prompts and doing things off of your own back. Which Nathaniel has kind of done by getting a tattoo just because it felt right in the moment. And he's potentially leaving his mantra, what he's been living by the last few years, especially on YouTube, he's decided to leave mental clarity behind him in search for something else. Looking at how to live life to the fullest. And speaking of that, the Olympics has come round. The Olympics is here, and as an avid watcher of sport, I will be consuming a lot of Olympics and paying attention and keeping up. But there are some incredible athlete stories out there from the last few years training and two stories that really piqued my interest were from the GB rowing team. One of the females has been working 12 hours in the doctors as an NHS doctor, 12 hours a day whilst finding time to train as an Olympic athlete. And the other individual has had three children since the last Olympics. So that's three children in five years and still manages to train as an Olympian, train as a semi-professional athlete because rowing isn't necessarily a professional sport. You can argue with me down in the comments with that one. But both of those people are rowing together in the Olympics, having basically done everything opposite of training in the last few years, but they still managed to qualify because 
that is what true productivity really is. And James Clear said it in his newsletter. Finishing projects is part of what it means to deliver high quality work. It's not high quality if your perfectionism prevents you from finishing. Now I'm sure the ladies training was not done to perfection because of their immense working days but they got it done no matter what. Serious concentration, shared and clear goals, good communication, familiarity, equal participation, shared risk, sense of control, and close listening all play roles in working with someone else. So communication is pretty key, despite masks obviously being a bit of an environmental limitation, which they spoke about on the Art of Coaching podcast, but your ability to work in a group or as a team in sport, life, or business environments all revolve around you being able to trust one another. And what they spoke about in the Art of Coaching podcast was social media, social media dynamics of the group. And social media is basically a group. It's just you don't know the group group dynamics. You don't know where you stand. You don't know what you can say. And that is the limitation of being in a small community on social media. But when you're working in a team in person, it's a little bit different. Which is where the sibling analogy used by Stephen Brad was quite nice. Basically saying siblings just know how to push your buttons. You can be perfectly fine having a great day. Your brother or sister comes in and then suddenly just starts irritating you and you're like, I was fine. You just know how to irritate me. And I think that's the same as on social media. And that's what they were speaking about. You have those individuals on social media that just know how to push those buttons. So the question then becomes, okay, do you stay in the group? that those people have now just encroached on? Or do you push them out, if you can, or do you leave the group? Because in the world we live in now, we can afford to just up and leave the group and go somewhere else, because there are loads of groups out there. But who can you actually trust in that group or community? Because just because someone's pushing your buttons doesn't mean it's for a bad reason. But as Seth said, trust me is easy to say when you mean it, but not always easy to hear, especially when we think about the fake scientists Anne was talking about earlier. This is where Adam Grant suggests to treat people like they are smart. So they are eager to learn, because if you assume that they are dumb, they tend to disengage. So from a scientific communicator's perspective, it's not necessarily about what you say. It's also about how you say it, which is where this incredible article from Brett comes in, and all the references are down in the description below, but if there is one reference that you should go read after this or watch after this, it would be this one, in my opinion. Brett was basically saying we should have reactive documents with contextual information and expandable examples, basically suggesting that when you're going through a piece, an article, a blog, you should be able to see the contextual information. So kind of like a Wikipedia with a pop-up or by having reactive documents so you can explore different avenues. So instead of just regurgitating or reading and adopting the view of the writer slash author, you can look through different contexts, look through different lenses, which we spoke about right at the beginning of the recap. And then the explorable examples where you can just dive into an idea or topic and go around all over the place, getting an idea of what is actually going on with the suggested theory or suggested output in data. This could be done through spreadsheets or through some nice, smart, techie stuff. But infographics are still pretty useful. This one is from Chris, and this is one of his many, many, many dense infographics around strength training. But this one just supporting the idea that stress impacts performance. Specifically, math questions can actually decrease your isometric strength performance. Talking about stress and pain, Tom is talking about the brain again and saying that learning is triggered by pain. Memory is triggered by pain because that's where things are located in our brain. And when you think about how deliberate practice works, it kind of makes sense. You pick a weakness. So you pick something all bad at potential perceived pain or friction, and then you work on that. You work on the weaknesses using feedback, using clear feedback. And this is what they spoke about on the Sport Psych Show. Deliberate practice may not be fun, but it's certainly more beneficial than just playing around with things. And pushing through that dip through deliberate practice shows that it's not about instant gratification, but long-term benefits. Bore out can kind of be the opposite. Instead of overtraining and doing too much deliberate practice, it's not doing enough. And there were some images that I saw on a blog that were really, really interesting. You can look at the day and you want the green zone. You want to be in the green zone. Either you're resting your brain in that flow state, that REM state of work, or you're in that red state where you're just 
not doing enough. You're not triggering enough. So you need to find a balance of pushing yourself forwards so that you don't suffer from bore out, but not too much that you end up burning out. And now all of that green zone suddenly becomes a bit of a, a red zone. But that makes us think about ourselves. Now, thinking about ourselves, self-referential thinking is not always a good idea in a lot of contexts. You see, when you start thinking about yourselves, how does that affect me? Are they talking to me? How can I do this? How do I do that? Why do they target me? It starts to revolve the world around you, which is what I spoke about a couple of weeks ago with narcissism and narcissists. Everything being about themselves, them being the center of the world. But how to ADHD actually associated self-referential thinking, thinking about ourselves with the labels we can give ourselves or labels we sort of adopt from other people. I'm clumsy. I'm silly. I don't understand this. I'm bad at this thing creates a fixed mindset. And so you struggle to do certain things because that is what you have as part of your identity. So in order to change that, you need to go outside of your internal thinking, your self-referential thinking and move outwards and try and challenge that with a growth mindset. Challenge the labels you've been given so you can develop and move forwards. Now, that is one of the reasons I don't actually go and get a diagnosis for ADHD or dyslexia or talk about my hearing impairment much because I don't need to. It's a label that doesn't really matter. And when I think about myself all the time, oh, I'm hard of hearing. I can't do this. I shouldn't do that. Music in the background is something I struggle with. So practice, learn, deal with it, work through it. Train the beast. And something that Cole actually brought up, as you solve one problem, two problems normally arise, which is very, very true, especially when you're trying to solve certain issues. Hopefully that's given you some insights and maybe some directions to go explore for next week. But until next Monday, get off YouTube and do something productive with your time instead.